Welcome engineers, my name is Travis IQ and I passed Pen Test Plus. In this video, I'll review my experience, I'll talk about the CompTIA domains and what I think about their domains and the relative testability. I'll talk a little bit about the actual structure of the exam, duration, types of questions, as well as relative experience level that CompTIA thinks that you need, and some comparable exams and what I think CompTIA's comparison of their Pen Test Plus versus some other Pen Test exams might be correct or incorrect. Let's go. So the first thing I wanted to start off with was the Pentest Plus domain objectives. Join me in, in the void as I give you a discussion around how I thought about the exam objectives and what I thought about their relative percentage of the exam and, and whether I thought I would spend my time actually focusing on them based upon their percentages or not. So the first thing I wanted to point out is, and this is just the way I think about it, but uh, 1.0 and 4.0, in in my opinion, seem to be domains that kind of line up a little bit more similarly, right? Planning and scoping and reporting and communication, right? So these are all things that have to do with the pen tester's interaction with the client or the organizing body, right? And so planning and scoping, they obviously do, they're going kind of in order here, or at least sort of in order here, right? Planning and scoping does happen at the beginning and reporting and communication kind of ha happens at the end for the most part, although it does partially happen in the middle, depending upon how frequently you're providing reports based upon the pen test you're conducting. And so in my opinion, I kind of think of these two combined. And you think about it, the, the, the way that they showed here, it represents something like 32% of the exam in terms of their you know, relative frequency of exam questions showing up. Do I think that this is the most accurate representation in terms of the study material that I that I saw and what helped me pass the exam? Um, I think it's probably pretty close. You know, if you think about a lot of the scoping and setup, a lot of the scoping and, and documentation, things that need to be signed, NDAs, statements of work, master service agreement, service level agreements, SLAs, these types of things, so planning and scoping, as well as a bunch of the other technicals that go into the type of pen test you're conducting. Is it a completely external pen test? Are you given some internal environment? Are you given some internal access and a, and a point to start pivoting from? These are all things that are going to start in the planning and scoping phase and then kind of dictate what the rest of it looks like. So I thought that it was pretty relevant and I do think that in terms of, for those of us that think of this as a very technical exam, if you think about something else, maybe an OSCP, which is a lot more, let's say, hands-on in terms of actually exploiting boxes immediately and then writing reports. Um, I, I would actually argue that this that this component, right, this one-third component here, reporting, communicating, planning, and scoping, represent uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know the full scope of a pen test, but don't actually represent a lot of technicals. Right? It really represents a lot of documentation, a lot of negotiation, a lot of responsibility and donning responsibility and how we handle responsibility and how we handle things like incidents and edge cases and these types of things. And so I do think that it's relevant. And I think that to be honest with you, if you're a more technical individual, you're like, oh, I like offensive security and, I, and I'm pretty good at blue team. So let's think about maybe taking a pen test plus and kind of moving into a more red team, red team field, then you might actually need to think about these a lot more because it's not necessarily just testing your understanding of Python or testing your understanding of PowerShell or testing your understanding of OSINT or something like this. It's actually, it's giving you a full holistic picture and part of that are these two. And I think that this is probably about right, maybe a, maybe a little high in terms of the, the relative frequency of the questions you might see. And the, and the reason I say that is because from an examiner, if I think about the way I would write a test, it seems like it would be redundant to write a lot of a lot of content around this this type of documentation, a lot of content around who you're reporting to and making sure the report is, let's say, structured in a way that conveys the material to the end user, which is, wh what do I mean by this? Uh, what I mean by this is whether I'm conducting a, a report that is being sent to a C-suite, whether it's being sent to application developers, whether it's being sent to blue team network defenders, whether it's being sent to SEM analysts who are writing rules, then that's gonna dictate what this report looks like a lot. Okay, so the, I wanted to start here and I think that these two kind of go together. So, so I gave you a little bit of inf information about the way I see this and the way I see about the relative per percentages. Then I think what really is represents the meat and potatoes of the exam in my opinion is, is this middling bulk, right? Information gathering, vulnerability scanning, attacks and exploits. And if you notice in terms of the relative percentages, if you kind of add them together here, you know, 52 plus percent is you know this meat and potatoes in the center. And I think this is where you really get to a, a, a bulk of testable material. 
attacks and exploits. So vectors as well as payloads, as well as the initial phases, which is information gathering, vulnerability scanning, and identifying the network. And so these are, are really important components. And I think that you know, if I were to spend the majority of my time, if I were completely green, then this is the area that I would spend it in. I would spend it in understanding information gathering, understanding vulnerability scanning attacks and exploits. And so what does this mean? Uh, from an information gathering and vulnerability standing, scanning standpoint, we can think about uh, some, some primary domains here, which would be things like network scanning and enumeration. Scanning and enumeration, enum. If we're thinking internally, a lot of people, a lot of people would probably go straight here. It's network scanning and enumeration. Also, we can think about things like open source intelligence, OSINT. And this is a particularly interesting avenue of, let's say, exploration for, if you, if you ever see, if you ever go to like hacking conferences or you go to some security talks or things like this where it's just a bunch of people having fun, uh, OSINT tends to be a really, a really interesting area, right? Because everyone can participate in this. Open source intelligence, finding information about companies, individuals, or targets based upon what's open and readily available on the internet, whether it's cached websites, whether it's social media, whether it's code or exposed co exposed backend code that exposes internal users, right? It's all like things that are available to you. You don't have to do anything. You might not even have to reach out to, the, you usually don't even have to reach out to the target system to get a bunch of this information. You can get some of that, you can even read some of the, the cached websites, right? Without ever having to, to reach out to the target system. So there, this is this is a number of areas here. Obviously vulnerability scanning and, and knowing some of the you know common vulnerability scanning utilities out there. I'll give you two examples off the top of my head, which would be something like OpenBA or Nessus. These are some very common vulnerability scanners. And then understanding the format that you're going to be given these vulnerabilities in. So you'll be given very likely, it depends on the vulnerability scanner and, and, and how it's how it's set up for you, right? But I would think of if we're talking about open source stuff and free and readily available or non-vendor, non-vendor specific, which is what CompTIA is, then I would be really aware of Right, the CVEs themselves, common vulnerabilities and exposures, and the CVSSs, common vulnerability scoring system. So, understanding how to read CVEs and CVSSs, possibly even understanding how to then take CVEs and CVSSs and format them into, let's say, things like Google Dorks or the Google Hacking Database to try and enumerate, to try and use Google to enumerate some of these vulnerabilities or maybe another enumeration toolkit or another scanning toolkit or another repository, something like Shodan, an IoT repository. And so now you see where we can go from not just scanning, not just enumeration, but also using that to leverage and understand what that exploit's gonna look like and where my target will be. So that's the first part, scanning and enumeration, and I think that that's super relevant, and all of these things that I have described to you here are extremely testable, and I'm trying to give you, in my opinion, the most testable content here. And then the second part of that is the attacks and exploits themselves. And so how do I how do I leverage attacks and exploits? And some of these, if I think about them, you could even think about, let's say, older exploits. So I'll give you an example like Eternal Blue, which was a Microsoft exploit that was used in a uh, really famous ransomware attack many, many years ago. Something like, let's say, WEP brute forcing or curb roasting or protocol exploits like SMB or LMNR. Any of these are viable attacks and exploit vectors as well as their associated payloads. I'll give you an example if you were to, let's say use some SMB exploit and use Responder to facilitate this, All right? The One of the primary payloads associated with a really well-known exploitation framework called Metasploit. I think these are all, again, I keep reiterating this, but these are some of the most Comp, these are some of the most testable things that I think are really, really relevant for an exam of this nature. And what what came up in my studies and it's kind of coming to the top of my brain as I summarize this for you, um, even before I kind of started here in the void with you, these were these were the primary components that I wanted to summarize in this talk with you. Finally, 
now that I've said what I think are relevant for, let's say almost 85% of the exam, we get to um, tools and code analysis. And so I think to tools and code analysis are probably that area that sticks out to me as maybe in one of these other areas, maybe in all of them combined, maybe not necessarily reporting and communication, but kind of in terms of, you know, reporting this effectively, but it kind of stands alone, which is, you know, this is more understanding applica application development and code analysis. And, and I actually talked about this in my days one through five, my prep for Pentest Plus was this was the area that I was weakest in. And what I found is, if you notice, it doesn't, relative to the other areas that I kind of summarized, doesn't necessarily represent the largest percentage. And I think that I, I, I would agree with that, right, in terms of my, in terms of, you know, my experience in the exam, where, you know, it was the weakest area for me, and I still found it, I still found it pretty easy to pass the exam based upon, you know, a limited, a limited study time frame. And so, right, I think that if you read into further into the objectives, and I'll put a link in the description below, which gives the full PDF, which uh, a link to the full PDF of all of these domains, and some additional content, because CompTIA publishes not just the domains, but also all of the content within these domains, that they consider testable. And so I most of this most of this that I'm pulling out here is within those content domains that they have even described in more depth, right? But I'm trying to summarize it for you here. But if you go into, you know, tools and code analysis, what CompTIA is going to say in the in the in the PDF that I've that I've linked below is that the the code that you should be familiar with is, you know, Python, Perl, Bash, PowerShell, command line and Windows Windows management in, in, instrumentation command, right? WMI and WMIC and, and, and CLI, other CLIs, right? This is a lot. And so what I want, I want you to think through, and if, if you're prepping for this exam, exam, be aware of this, that we're trying to prioritize based upon the relative frequency that we're gonna see in exam questions, whether we think that's right or wrong in terms of if you're a pen tester now and you're going, Travis, I really should know all these and it's gonna be really relevant for me in my job, I get it, right? But if you're thinking about 16% of this exam and a huge swath of information that can be held in Python, Perl, Bash, PowerShell, WMI, and other command line, and other command line utilities, right? This is not gonna be the best place to spend your time. Am I telling you not to understand it at all? No, but I'm telling you don't get lost in the weeds of small PowerShell, of po small PowerShell command line utilities, little one-liners. Don't go trying to memorize some of the most useful one-liners in pen testing for PowerShell. Don't go trying to memorize some of the, some of the niche Python pip install packages that are going to be used in in in, Py in Python utilities. Right? Understand some of the most common, you know, Python. Python scripts that are out there that are that are really useful. Uh, uh, one that comes to mind is something like volatility. Volatility, which is a memory dumping and digital forensics tool, which is really useful. And then how how I would use these in combination. Let's say I would use something like Netcat along with volatility to analyze RAM, but also not change the state, the state of the system. This is a very common, this is a very common mechanism. And so maybe understanding some of the scripting, the language itself, and some of its base utilities, as well as let's say some combinations of utilities and, and the scripting languages, that might be a little bit better for you than just going and deep diving into Python, Perl, Bash, WMI, and the CLI. So be aware of these things. And then obviously, right, I would say if you're if you're prepping for Pen Test Plus, you're probably not going to become an expert in code analysis overnight. And so I would take some representative test questions and find some cool code analysis, let's say short you short instructional components and, and maybe try and get a little bit better if it's something that I'm not very good at, right? Um, that's what that's my suggestion. Um, and I wouldn't spend, you know, inordinate amount of time on it based upon its relative frequency in the exam. Again, it can come up, but if you're gonna whiff on a single code analysis question and get 90% of the exam right, I think you're gonna be just fine. So think about it that way, right? Yes, you want to prove your knowledge and yes you want to be as as skillful as you profess to be when you pass the exam, but the whole goal here is to pass the test. Just remember that, right? Let's move on then.
The next thing is the, the actual exam itself. It's a max of 85 questions. What you'll notice in any number of these exams, not just CompTIA exams, but usually the maximum number of questions is not necessarily at the total volume of questions that you're going to receive, right? You're usually gonna receive you know, between 80 and 95% of that maximum question number. So what does that look like? Something between like 65 and 80 questions, in my opinion. Could you get 85? Yes, could you get 52? Possibly, right? But then what I'm saying is don't freak out about this maximum number of questions and the relative time frame. Uh, it, it also uses performance-based and multiple choice, a lot a lot of single select multiple choice, and the performance-based questions in CompTIA infrastructures, in my opinion, are known for um, not necessarily being um, the most dynamic uh, testing engine. What, what does that mean? You'll, you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about this, what it means when I get to comparing it to other exams, just because, you know, it's really difficult to make a dynamic exam right, with, with a really good test engine and then turn it over every three years. And so if we look down here, how often do these exams get turned over? Usually three years after launch. This is the 002 exam here. This is the old exam, right? The 002, the most recent version that I took as well. And so if you're gonna turn these exams over every couple of years and you're gonna build giant pen testing infrastructures every couple of years, it's gonna be very difficult to do. And so what you end up doing is, you know, hybridizing with things like multi-select, multiple choice and drag and drops and click through infrastructures. So just be aware, right, that if that's, if that's an infrastructure that's more likely to be examined, then you should be you should be prepared for that type of stuff. Now, if you're going to go into like an OSCP, for example, where it's well known that these infrastructures are well built out and very difficult to navigate, right, in terms of like actual practical navigation and, and penetration testing, then you should be prepared for that if you're going to take a different exam. And I'll talk about that in a second here. It's uh, 165 minutes. It's a long time. It's two hours plus, right? 220, 235 or 245, right? Two hours, 45 minutes. Uh, you know, that's a really long time to take an exam. So be aware that you're going to be in there for a long time. You got to keep your brain active and engaged the entire time. That's difficult to do. And uh, passing score 750 out of on a 100 to 900 scale. What does that mean? Something like an 80 or an 85 percent. But the passing scores aren't really published by CompTIA. The uh, what that actually means in terms of relative percentage is not necessarily. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily an 85 or a 65. It's probably somewhere in between there and 65 percent or an 85 percent or something like this. But again, don't freak out about that the passing score and because the scale is different. And the the goal is to just do the best that you can. Go in there, ex answer as many correct questions correct as you can, come out and see what you got, right? And so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to optimize our test prep. We're trying to optimize the way that we think about the exam and prepping for the exam so that we don't we don't spend an inordinate amount of time trying to pass the exam and then and then pass really easily and say, hey, we just wasted a ton of time passing this thing. Now I got to go out and actually do offensive stuff. But we also don't want to underprepare and not pass the exam. So be aware, the, the goal here is optimizing. I think people forget sometimes that passing these types of certification exams is as much about passing an exam as it is about proving your knowledge in my opinion and you know that is it is what it is uh finally you know it's it's expensive so if, if an employer or something like that doesn't pay for it then then you know there is something else to think about there in terms of you know how much time you spend on the exam and how much time you spend to pass it um hopefully you can get somebody that you're employed with or some other uh, additional funding to get get an exam like this paid for that's always an, a much easier way to go in an exam right knowing that you're not gonna be out four hundred dollars to pass the exam and that's how a lot of people pay for exams too right employers or alternate pay, alternate funding sources be aware of that as well so when you're in there like thinking about how i'm going to take and pass this test or what that means for me and what that means for the price, um, look into these uh, alternate avenues. Finally, CompTIA also, I just found this interesting and I'm going to include it at the end here, is, uh, you know, they kind of talked about how CompTIA compares to some other exams, the Pen Test Plus versus CEH. I don't, uh, I haven't taken GPEN, so I don't know much about it. I'm not going to speak to it. And OSCP, which I haven't taken, but I've heard a lot of, I know a lot of people who have taken this exam. And so I find it interesting, right, that CompTIA, CompTIA takes their Pen Test Plus with some performance-based questions and compares it favorably to the OSCP. I think that anybody who has taken these exams before and understands the OSCP versus, let's say, a Pentest Plus or CEH understands that OSCP is much more practical and the performance-based questions and the performance-based infrastructure is much more dynamic than CompTIA or EC Council, which doesn't, their, their performance-based questions don't really exist. So uh, be aware that while CompTIA will say that the PBQs, performance-based questions, are included in a Pentest Plus and also in an OSCP, everyone and their brother believes, and it, it well, well within their rights to believe so, that the OSCP is a much more practical exam. If you see someone with an OSCP cert, right, you're going to say this is a, a much more seasoned red teamer than someone with, let's say, a CEH, a Pentest 
Access Plus or probably a G Pen. So just just letting you know kind of how we think about it in the industry and how a lot of the folks that I see in the industry and, and interact with on a regular basis feel about these exam infrastructures uh, for, for better or for worse. Um, that being said, right, um, all of these exams are focused on pen testing, but that real world lab is is definitely the, the real icing on the cake. It's what makes an OSCP significantly more difficult as well. Um, they all are technically vendor neutral, although you'll see a lot more, in my opinion, vendor specific stuff, not just one vendor, but a lot, a lot of you know, third party vendors will pop up on the CEH. Uh, because of EC Council's interaction with third-party vendors than you would on a CompTIA. Um, and then also, right, you'll see um, the utilization of, you know, I, I would say open source, but also some third-party tools in these real world based labs that you can do too. So uh, be aware that I would say actually the most vendor neutral cert out there is the CompTIA stuff in my opinion. So that's probably an advantage for them as well. So just the way to think about the exams, um, the way I think about them as well. That being said, I thought it was a good exam. I would encourage you to take some of my advice here, do some of your own independent prep, reach out uh, in the comments below or at me on Twitter or, uh, or Instagram, wherever you, wherever you wanna find me. As is always the case, Engineer, break stuff, have fun. We'll see you next time. Let's go.